I'd like to welcome our director, Cash Carruth. Like Brett said, I'm, I'm Cash Carruth. I'm from New Mexico. Um, I have a good friend here from the southern part of the state that uh, is fixing to speak. Her name is Erica Valdez. She, uh, is raised, she was raised on the boot hill of New Mexico. She graduated from New Mexico State with a bachelor's in ag business and a master's in ag extension and education. Today, her and her husband own and manage a family ranch near Animas, New Mexico, where they also raise and train quarter horses and have a 17-year-old daughter they homeschool. Erica is active in the New Mexico cattle growers, New Mexico cowbells, New Mexico farm and livestock bureau, and sits, and sits on a committee for the New Mexico women in ag leadership. In addition to ranching and homeschooling, she, her and her family compete extensively in rodeo and team ropings and horse shows. Thank y'all so much for having me. Is the volume okay back in the back? Okay. What I do need is the remote to click through the pictures. So while they're finding that, just uh, wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, like Cash says, I was raised in southern New Mexico. My husband and I moved back to my family's ranch in 2010 and have managed it for the last 13 years. Uh, we just, I thought that was a remote for something else, sorry. <laughs> we just uh, purchased part of the ranch this last year, so uh, we've moved from, from working it to owning it and working it, and it's been quite an interesting transition. I was raised in that part of the country. I know the border uh, situation like it's the back of my hand it was just this a part is how we were raised growing up and I was having a conversation earlier with somebody and they said um, I cannot believe or I don't understand how you are so okay with sending your daughter out to, to gather and uh, and worrying about the illegals and and everything that comes with them and I said it's just part of it's part of growing up you know you raise your kids to know you don't walk behind that horse you watch for rattlesnakes, all those things. We have those same exact conversations in addition to watch for illegals, make sure no one's brushed up under, you know, whatever country you're riding through. Those kind of things are just part of the everyday conversation for us. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here and kind of tell you my story, give you a little more insight into what it's like living and ranching on, this, on the U.S.-Mexico border. Let me make sure I can figure out how to work this. Oh, there we go. So that's my family. Um, I'm ashamed to admit that my daughter is now 17. That is the most recent family picture we have. As, <laughs> as many times as I've had this conversation and done this presentation, I still have not updated that picture. So I'm gonna go home and make it a point. We're branding Sunday, maybe I can get it done then. Um, because we have a teenage daughter, we have always worked a crew of girls. My poor husband lives in the sea of estrogen. We have mostly girl crews to gather, brand, wean, ship, preg, it doesn't matter. That's what we have is a, a full crew of girls. And we're very fortunate because we trade work with some really great families. And those families, you know, understand what it's like where we live and understand what we deal with. But from a mother's perspective, it really stresses me out <laughs> to be responsible for their safety out on the ranch and uh, it's a very, it, it weighs heavy on my heart and it's one of those things that we just have to get around because it's home and that's where we're gonna be. Um, this particular picture is what started me on this journey. It was 2021, uh, we had, we were overrun by illegals. We, it was right during the um, asylum seeker surges that were coming across the border and it was every day we were seeing five, 10, 20, it didn't matter. And when I dropped my daughter and her friend off, I said, you have got to pay attention. Stay off your phones. Make sure that you're watching where you're going. 
make sure because that canyon that they were going to be riding down was pretty heavily traveled and there was a lot of trails through there and I just knew that they were most likely going to end up jumping a, a bunch of illegals and so I remember I topped out and I was mad I was mad and I took that picture of him and I get home and by we make the gather everything's fine I about killed my horse that day because I topped out over the ridge at least 15 times to make sure they were okay and by the time the drive came together everything was fine we got our cattle moved and the day was over but um, the that night I was still fired up that I'd had to have that conversation again and I posted this picture on Facebook with my little rant and a friend of mine from New Mexico Farm Bureau called me and says we need to talk but can I come and do an interview with you and I didn't really think much about it I I had been it had been probably five years since I'd done any kind of interview and had taken any kind of media crew to the border but I said okay let's go ahead and, and do it my husband I'm gonna backtrack in a minute but we had had a little bit of cartel threats four or five years prior to that and I had shut my mouth for quite a while and so my husband said yeah you can go ahead and and do the interview and let's see let's see what happens from it so I put the picture on Facebook we have the interview it kind of goes viral from New Mexico Farm Bureau's website or Facebook page and here are the phone calls come in and once again we were back to taking uh, film crews to the border legislators to the border um, anybody that wanted to see it and wanted to visit about the realities of it that's kind of how I I got into this because I couldn't keep my big mouth shut <laughs> um, in 2017 I was riding in this country my husband and I had just split up um, split up together not split up but split up together <laughs> that sounded really bad <laughs> we had just split up together he was gonna take one side I was gonna take the other we were riding in some mountain country to see if we could find any uh, you know trash or junk that we had le met left back in there and I was riding through this canyon I had just taken this picture and I had dropped down into this really narrow bottom canyon and my horse stopped to pee and I remember I was looking up on the slopes to see uh, if there were any cattle up on the slopes and I looked for in front of me and from me to that table was a juniper tree with four illegals underneath it they were dressed in American military camo they had black masks on they had uh, carpet shoes big big bales uh, like bundles of marijuana on their back and they were all heavily armed and I kind of I kind of startled and I reached for my pistol and as soon as I did they got sort of aggressive not like they didn't make a move but you could just tell they kind of got puffed up and and I took my hand off my pistol and kind of went like this and um, I didn't say anything to him as soon as my horse was done peeing I had to ride right by him to get up that canyon and not to not 100 yards past him I found some cattle that I had to kick back down into that draw by them so I get my cattle gathered I'm, I ha and there's no cell phone service I get my cattle gathered I get back in that draw ride right by that juniper bush they were gone long gone and it was maybe an hour so the next day I was back in that same country and I'd come in from the other side and uh, I had come around this big peak the peak that I'd been looking up the day before and I thought I would climb up top to see if I could see anything um, sure enough I get almost to the top and there's a saddle and I kind of I got off my horse was kind of winded so I loosened her cinch and just stood there for a minute looked around and there was a spotters camp up on top of that peak very fresh very very fresh spotters camp so if a spotters camp is they usually have one guy with very um, high-tech radio equipment cameras guns that kind of thing where they can radio down to whoever's on the ground for people that are coming up that might surprise them especially Border Patrol and I'm certain that the day before they had he had had me in his sights he had radioed those to those guys to brush up and it was just it was really scary the blessing to me was that my daughter just happened to be at a friend's house that week she was off rodeoing and I uh, I she wasn't there because if she had been there she would have been the one to ride that canyon because it was the easier country so that's just one of the one of the many experiences that we go through before you play that the video hold on one second um,
So to back up, in 2010, which is the year that my husband and I moved back to the ranch, um, we had a very good friend of mine that I went to high school with. I grew up with his parents. His dad was killed by an illegal uh, out when he was out checking waters. He had radioed in to say that he had found an illegal in distress and he was going to go help him. That was the last radio contact they had with him. They found him later that night. He was shot. His dog was shot. And the ranger was, or his, his ranger was just sitting there. Um, my daughter was four years old at the time, and I remember in the, my husband's from southern Colorado, had never been around anything like this when he moved down there, and he was like, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, so we would had all those conversations with Danley as she was growing up. For, fast forward to 2015, a local well driller was kidnapped by illegals on the border. He was down there, went to get some heavy equipment and walk it out of this canyon, and he just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, some drug runners that had come through the night before with, with a drive through had buried their pickup. They took him at gunpoint, uh, threw all their drugs in his work truck and drove him across state lines into Arizona. Took his license, took his wallet, said, if you say anything or talk to the police, we will come kill your family. And so when they finally got him back two days or a day, day and a half later, it was, he wouldn't say anything. And to this day, he still hasn't. He's talked to his employers a little bit about it. He's still working for them. He still goes down to the border. That didn't even make national news, nothing. When Rob was killed, there was quite a bit of media coverage around it because, um, because of his wife and the, and the pressure that she put on the mainstream media. But when, um, when the well driller was killed, nothing. When they, it didn't even make state news, much less national news. And so I just feel like there's such a misconception with what you're hearing on, from the mainstream media versus what we're actually in, enduring every day. So I know I only have 30 minutes. We're probably only about 15 now. So I'm going to zip through pictures. I have a lot of pictures. I'm going to give you a pretty good explanation or just idea of some of the, the circumstances that, that we deal with every day. If you can play that video. My uncle, my father, and myself sat down for breakfast and talked about what we were going to do for the day. When we finished, my cousin and I were to, went to move cows while my father went to check the motor and my uncle went to check other waters on the ranch. That was the last time I saw my father. Rob Krantz was on his way to check the motors when he called his brother on a cell phone and said there was someone walking across the pasture and was going to see what was going on. Friends and neighbors came to help us look for my father that afternoon when we couldn't get hold of him for hours. A neighbor called the sheriff's search and rescue team and they started looking as well. The news came in late that night that they had found my father. Rob was a great and caring man, <clears throat> helpful to others and dedicated to the way of life that he loved. He worked to help others, volunteering his time to help the local school, his community, family, and friends. To understand where I'm coming from, you need to know the people that live in this area. Most of the people in this part of the world has had at least one incident that has involved problems with trespassers across the southern border illegally. When I was younger, I would see people crossing the border and knew that they were running from problems worse than getting caught on the nor northern side. Knowing that the Arizona desert can be dangerous to cross, we would make sure that there would be border patrol on the way to help them. I can remember a time in 1999, I saw two different groups of people crossing the ranch that numbered larger than 100. We used to approach these people as Christians to make sure there was no injuries and to tell the Border Patrol that they would shortly be there to help them. We would always do this even after we have had our houses broken into, our vehicles stolen, trash left in the country, and water lines broken. There has been many times when we would go and check storage tanks that we had spent a week's worth of time to make full, be drained because illegals would break water lines or floats to get a drink of water and draining thousands of gallons of water out on the land. And we would still try our best to get these people help. After losing my father, all of that changed. Now, we don't go near these people. Not knowing what the situation holds, we don't put ourselves in a situation where we can get ourselves into trouble. The people that we see now are not the large groups of hundreds or more, but a people fleeing, small groups with bundles on their backs. There's been pictures of these same groups packing 
armed weapons. You can one of our employees. Was was an armed weapon? Um, I want to, I, I wish that I could show you the whole video, but I, we are gonna be short on time, so I'm gonna skip through some of that. What we did after Ken's kidnapping was we put on a series of community meetings inviting our legislators and we uh, worked with Arizona cattle growers and New Mexico cattle growers and we invited every media outlet we could and we had quite a bit of success from it. What it really did more than anything was bring media attention to it. We didn't really get much done as far as legislation goes. but we did get a lot of media outlets interested and we had a lot of interviews and we did a lot of tours and, and they were able to actually see the border and kind of get a better idea of what it really is like on the southern border. So um, the entire US-Mexico border is about 1900 miles. In New Mexico, there's 181 miles of border. And uh, these are old statistics because I don't have the new st statistics with the new wall in place, but at the, Prior to the new wall, we had 103 feet of wall, 58 miles of barbed wire, and 16 miles of Normandy and vehicle barrier. And then I think there was like four, four or five miles of pedestrian fencing, which is what you see that stretches east and west of your border towns typically. Um, with Trump's uh, construction of the wall, I think another 60 something miles in New Mexico was, was developed and then a lot of the older wall that was there was torn down and replaced. So um, I think altogether he really only added about 264 miles of wall, but it was a lot of the old and existing wall was, was replaced with the new wall, which was a godsend. So it's really hard to see on this map, but I, I'm gonna zoom in. Um, where the long red line stops and the wall or the fence goes south, that is what we call Monument 40. And that section of land is what we call the boot heel of New Mexico. The dotted line is all barbed wire still. Trump's wall extended all the way to Monument 40, which was a blessing for everybody that was north of that. But that section that goes all the way down and extends to the, to the west is still barbed wire. The little black spot down there on the kind of bottom left of the screen or of the fence is a town called Antelope Wells. And I call it a town with like there's a lot of freedom there. It's basically one building, but it is a port. And so there's some pedestrian fencing there and I'll get, I'm gonna go through some pictures and kind of give you an idea so you have a visual. But you can see a lot of the fence in New Mexico is still, is still barbed wire. Now the problem with this is this, when they shut down the construction of the wall, it just basically made a funnel right up over the top of us and everybody that's north of us. Um, our ranch is, you can see Lordsburg up at the top left. We start about 16 miles south of Lordsburg and um, we go all the way down to about, we're about 40 miles from the border. We do not actually have any border fence, any, any border fence. We are, we're north of, we neighbor one ranch that has the majority of that southern boot hill and they don't let border patrol on them. They don't let the National Guard on them. It's completely deeded land, which is rare for New Mexico. And so we don't have any, tr they don't, enforce any traffic until they get to us and we do let the border patrol on us. So um, just to kind of give you an idea, the, where the wall stops everywhere from McAllen all the way to San Diego, there's these funnels that has just opened it up for the traffic to come through. And it's not just the asylum seekers, there's an increase in the drug traffic, uh, the human smugglers and then the asylum seekers as well. So this is Monument 40. Um, this picture was taken before the wall construction. So up to this point, if you're coming in from, from the east, there is a wall all the way to that, but then it extends back down south as just barbed wire. This is the town uh, called Antelope Wells that is a crossing. This was prior to the construction as well. And you can see that Normandy barrier right there. This is all, all of that has been replaced with the wall, but you can see from here, it stops. And so the wall goes up to this point and then it just continues into barbed wire. And for, it's probably four or five miles from Antelope Wells, which you can see is a little tiny dark spot in the very ba back of that picture. Uh, so the wall re reaches four or five miles east and west of that town and then it's back to barbed wire. And it's rough and it's rocky and it's dry and it's horrible conditions to try to get across 
but they do it every single day. Um, every mile along the fence, they have these monuments that depict the US-Mexico border. And so I just was taking some pictures so you could kind of see what it looks like. This is a little town called Las Chepas. It's in Mexico. At this point, that vehicle barrier has been replaced with the wall. Um, some, the friends of ours that own the ranch on the American side have eight miles of border fence right there. They were having four to five drive throughs a week. A week. No, they, no compensation for maintaining that fence. That it was up to them to maintain it, to fix it, to go out in the middle of the night and repair it. If their cattle got across, sorry. No compensation from the US government to maintain that fence. It was their responsibility solely. Uh, you can see the little town of Las Chepas down in the, in the background there. That vehicle barrier ran maybe three miles from the town and then it turned into to, uh, barbed wire again. This was the night that they had a drive through. I don't know what time it was, but the border patrol called them and said, hey, you had a drive through. We, we caught the vehicle and the guys and they were out there at whatever time it was by headlights fixing fence so their cattle didn't get back across. More monuments, and I'm gonna zip through this because I know we're short on time. Um, this is just the pictures of a wash. You can't see it very well from here. Oh, I went too far. But uh, where that picture was, about a mile or two south is what they call, they call it mile, or highway two I think is what it is, in Mexico. Um, all this footage that you see of the asylum seekers making these 100 mile treks is false. They were getting bused to that mile two, or highway two, and walking the last three or four miles in to the, into the American, or into the United States. Um, sure, some of them made a, uh, some treks to get to a bus, but the majority of them were bused to that highway and they walked the last couple miles. It was not hundreds of miles of trek, of, of worth of walking. This picture is what the old wall looks like. It's 18 feet tall. Um, this was, excuse me, one that stretched east and west of Columbus, New Mexico. Um, pretty easy to scale, but fairly tall still. Um, this was some pictures of the Normandy fencing. And you can see this was during the, the wall, border wall construction. What's interesting to me is when those construction crews were on the border, there was zero traffic through there. No drugs, no human smugglers, no asylum seekers because there was presence on the border and because of that, they weren't coming across. So wherever the wall construction was not happening is where they would go. And as construction moved, then they would move back to where it wasn't. It, it was interesting to me to see the change in the flow of the traffic and, and the location of the traffic because of the presence on the border. More pictures of the border wall construction. Um, so this is my, this is one of my interesting, uh, interesting to me. They put these floodgates in, in all the, like the low bottom flood areas along the border. Well, we don't get a lot of rain, but when we do, it rains hard and water runs hard. And so they have these giant, you know, channels for the water to come through. All this brush and debris builds up. They cannot go back in and shut those gates. So it just leaves wide open uh, passage for anybody that wants to climb over the rubble. Um, this, is a this is some pictures of the, the wall construction itself and the, the massive miles and miles of material that they brought in to, to put into place. Whenever the wall was shut down, the material is still sitting there. I saw on Facebook a couple weeks ago that they are gonna start auctioning it off. It's been sitting out in the weather for the last two years, um, or three years, two years. This is at, this is one, of, they call it the Tucson Project, but it is west of Douglas, Arizona. This is what the new wall looks like. It's 23 feet tall, I think. They added an extra five feet and put this solid sheet at the top. Um, they had entire, massive construction crews on the border and the land that they tore up to put those construction sites up. It was just, it's in incredible how much land they destroyed. Um, the, the pile on the right is all Normandy barrier that they tore out. It's still sitting there on ranchers' property, just sitting there, and it's gonna be up to them to get rid of it. 
I'm talking miles and miles, tons and tons of metal. But this is what the new wall looks like. The other thing is these gaps. And every so often, I don't, there's not any rhyme or reason to it, but they have these gaps in the wall where they covered it back up with Normandy barrier. So it's basically just funnels and holes all along the, all along the wall for traffic to come through. The only good thing about it is it kind of centralizes the, the traffic, and so the Border Patrol has a, a smaller area to cover because they know where they're coming in at. Um, drainage ditches that were just left whenever President Biden shut down the construction, this is what's left. Not, these are, they're not functioning, they're just taking up space. This was the day that the wall was, the construction was shut down and the crews were in there loading up what they could. Everything else was just left on, ranch, on the rancher's property. More of the floodgates, which they're supposed to go in and open them prior to the monsoon season starting. And then I really, I, I, don't, I don't even know how they're gonna go clean out all of those floodgates after the rains are over, but they're still completely ineffective, as you can tell. Same with these, more holes in the wall with uh, Normandy barrier blocking it. You can see up on the side of that the hill, there's a big, like a white spot. That is where they were starting the construction up the side of those mountains. And uh, it's just wide open bare space now because it's after it was um, stopped. So this is just a real quick explanation or, or statistics on what drugs have come in. It's interesting to me, the very, the yellow line that running across the top, that's the, I don't know if you can read it from here, but it, that's marijuana. Um, in 2022, Fiscal year to date, we're almost halfway there already. Meth is the next one below. <coughs> Cocaine and fentanyl, which is in, if you look at the fentanyl numbers, we are not even, we're barely halfway through 2023 and we've already surpassed what was brought in in 2022. So um, it's very alarming. And I say it all the time. Yes, as border residents, we're dealing with the traffic and the destruction and the damage to property, but the drugs are not staying where we're at. The, the people that are coming across are not staying where we're at. They're coming to your schools and your communities. Um, this was a bus that was down in South Texas and they had to use this rancher's trailer to haul it all out. More drug bus, more drug bus. I don't remember exactly where this one was. This was a drive through gone wrong. You can see the camouflage on the car. Um, I have a lot of game pictures of cartels coming through and the mules carrying drugs. This is more drugs. And I'm really sorry, I hate to rush you or rush through them, but I want to be able to at least give you an idea and let you look at the majority of the pictures. A friend of mine took these. He was riding his horse on the border and saw this group that was fixing to cross with drugs. Um, they're all armed. Oops, I went too far. They were all armed. They had. Um, carpet shoes on and big bales, and he just took that picture and then kept on riding. So, in uh, you heard Frank talk about in that video in the 90s, there was a what we were seeing coming across us was the majority of family units mom, dad, several kids, maybe even a grandma or grandpa in tow, large groups coming across, humble, grateful, thankful, would take any thing that you wanted to offer them, but they wouldn't take it for free. They wanted to work. They wanted to repay you somehow. They were just a, just genuinely looking for a better way of life. Um, the orange part of the screen is the Sinaloa cartel and the purple part is the Juarez cartel. At, in 1999, they had a huge cartel war. Right where those colors merge, just north of there is, is us. That's where we ranch at and the destruction and the devastation from those cartel wars was horrendous. I cannot even explain to you how graphic some of the stuff we saw out on the ranch was, and especially in the border towns like Palomas and like Juarez. I don't know if you ever remember seeing, it did make national news that there would be like bodies hanging from the overpasses, that kind of thing. It's just a gruesome, gruesome cartel war. Um, Ignore all the stuff on the bottom that's like very confusing. But I wanted you to be able to see where the, the cartel, the territory wars were coming and how that affected us because it was 
you never knew if you were going to run into someone from the Juarez cartel or the Sinaloa cartel or if you were out in the pasture and just happened to be caught in the middle of the two that were trying to fight over some territory right on your place. So how are the drugs getting here? I, uh, I'm not anti-wall. I'm not pro-wall alone. I, I, I want to make sure that you understand that. I feel like the wall is definitely going to slow down traffic. It's definitely going to slow down the human smuggling. But the cartels are going to find a way under it, over it, and through it. And I have about 30 pictures here to show you just, just that case. The problem is, is if we don't have Border Patrol on the border and allowing them to do their job, there's no way this wall is going to stop it. They're going to torch through it. They're going to drive through it. They're just going to lay the fence down and drive over it because that's what they do. They're going to try to drive over it, which wasn't super effective. <laughs> um, more drive-throughs that didn't really go as planned. This particular bus, there were, um, I think they said, six or seven kids under 16 years old that tried to make that drive-through. And all the drugs were confiscated. They were all in the back. And all of those kids made it back into Mexico. They're going to tunnel under it, which the, the time and effort that these cartels put into building these tunneling systems is phenomenal. If they would use it for something productive, imagining, just imagine how, how productive they could be. Um, we're talking ventilation. They've got lifts. They've got electricity. It's, in, it's incredible. More tunnels. They're going to go over it. This is in... Um, Agua Prieta, Mexico. It's on the border of Douglas. We go to Douglas quite a bit for grocery shopping. And you'll be sitting at a restaurant or driving down the road, and you'll hear this kapoom. And then all of a sudden, something flies over the wall. They're just going to catapult him right on over the wall in the middle of town in the middle of broad daylight. <laughs> this was a catapult that they found uh, south of Douglas, or no, excuse me, east of Douglas. And they were catapulting drugs over the wall there. All up and down where we're at, you encounter signs like this all the time. Um, this is a shrine that, hold on, I'm going to tell you exactly what it's called. Juan Soldado, patron saint of undocumented immigrants. They, there's shrines like this up and down the border where they, you know, light a candle and say their prayers before they come across. Another shrine. Um, I have five seconds. I'm rushing. So uh, these are the southwest land border encounters, 22 to 23, I think. Yeah, this is 23. Altogether, 1.5 million. 963,000 were under Title VIII, and 549,000 were under Title 42. We are in the El Paso district, which is the darker green right in the middle. But what's interesting to me is out of those um, encounters, the bottom on the bottom screen, single adults, over 1 million single adults, 365 family units, and 94,000 unaccompanied children and single minors. Here's some more numbers. Look at the, the statistics up from 2021, up 429% for the family units. That is insane. From 2020 to 2021, the same for the single adults, up 285% from 21, from 20 to 21. It's just, it's unreal to me. And the 2023 to date, the single adults, um, we've almost caught up to 22, and we still got four months to go, or five months to go. Um, you can play the next video. So this is a really good example of what it's like for us every single day. You're riding out, gathering cattle, and trotting across a pasture, and you see something up ahead, you're not really sure what it is, and just keep watching because you'll see. This is what we tell, we are always preaching to Danley, you've got to pay attention, like stay off your phone, be looking around because you never know who's going to be brushed up or what's going to be brushed up, and you're hoping that it's a bunch like this and they're just single males heading north looking for work. Um, you're really hoping that it's not a group of drug smugglers. Here's, it's, I mean, 
I can't even, I'm so glad Russell posted this video on Facebook because when he did, I called him right away and I said, can I use that for my talks? And he said, absolutely, because I never think to take pictures of it or document it. And now that I've been doing these presentations, I'm always asking somebody, please, if you have pictures or if you have video, please send it to me. But that's a bunch of, of single uh, males that were just heading north and he sees them, tells them to go on their way and they head north and he goes back to work, which is, that's very common for us. I'm gonna get real quick, I'm gonna zip through some of the drug pictures just so you can see some of the cartel units coming through. Um, these were all either taken with game cameras, taken by border patrol that I trust, or taken by friends that I trust, or taken by us. You can see, um, this friend of mine sent me this, he came in to, to work one morning, they have a big feed, feed yard down on the very, very border, southern border in Arizona, and this guy had just decided to take a nap for the night. Um, more, these guys were picked up by Border Patrol. Lots of, lots of traffic. I'm trying to get to the one in particular. You can see the carpet shoes in that picture. They basically take whether it's like a, a blanket or some kind of carpet material, wrap it around their foot, sew it or tie it together, and it's supposed to disguise their footprints coming through. See more pictures of the carpet shoes there. There was a bunch coming through. My friend that took the picture of those guys fixing to cross, he's the one that took that picture. These were them just, just starting to cross the border. And you can see it's um, just the the, uh, excuse me, the vehicle barriers that they can just crawl right through. This girl was picked up, she was 16. She'd been wandering for two days by herself. A friend of mine uh, in Arizona took this picture. He's the one that actually found her and called Border Patrol in to have them come pick her up, 16 years old. Lots of little babies now is what we're seeing, the, the family units coming in. After, and these are all, these are all asylum seekers. I really hate to rush through it. I wish I didn't have to, but it is, it is what it is. So what happens after they leave us? This is what happens. Trash and trash and trash. Everywhere you look, cans, backpacks, bottles of water, any kind of um, jug and blanket and jacket that you can possibly imagine, that is what's left on us. Um, some friends of ours down in just north of, or south of Deming, New Mexico, went in, they finally got tired of seeing all the backpacks, went in with rangers and four-wheelers, made a sweep through there and picked them all up. These were, this is one pasture on their place right off the highway. So, and the reason that there's so many backpacks there is these guys come in and leave everything once they find their pickup man. And so they just leave whatever's, whatever they had or whatever they brought across with them out in the desert. My husband took this picture. It was some carpet shoes and a jug that some, they had stashed in, a, in a, some brush. More blankets. My friend, she was gonna take her kids to school one day. She walked out the door and these were on her porch. They had just changed in the middle of the night and got their pickup. Same friend, she was taking her kids to the school bus one morning. She saw this backpack stuck in this utility pole with a knife and she stopped to take a picture of it and all of a sudden, four guys swarmed her and they, she thinks that, that that was a marker for a drop and that she, when she stopped, the guys probably thought that she was their pickup and uh, she just left as soon as she could and took her kids to the bus stop and then went right back by him to go back home. More backpacks, more backpacks. Um, this was a bad deal, this was, this was on us. They broke this valve one night and drained 10,000 gallons overnight. And it was 115 degrees at that time for several weeks straight and it took us weeks to catch up. Pumping every single night, trying to catch up to keep water. We had like 500 head on that line. And uh, that happens all the time. Carpet shoes that were left behind afterwards. More carpet shoes, more carpet shoes. They're pretty, I mean, they're pretty ingenious with how they keep them on. This was um, at a drop 
off of the highway, um, some Border Patrol agent was going by and had seen this pile, so they had come, they'd come through, they found their, their pickup guy, just left everything on the side of the road. <laughs> There's some pretty uh, ingenious way of camouflaging your tracks. Um, this was a Border Patrol agent that's a friend of mine took those out of, or took a picture of them at, um, at a processing unit and sent it to me. So um, the next few pictures I'm gonna show you are pretty graphic. I'm glad y'all are done eating lunch and I'm sorry that this is during lunch. But uh, this was a 16 year old girl. My friend found her floating in a sock tank one morning when he went out to check heifers. Um, her face was completely bashed in. He had to call border patrol. They wouldn't get her out because they didn't wanna get in the water. He had to rope her body and drag her to the shore and um, they don't know if she was running from something or someone or just running at night and fell and bashed her head and fell in the water or if she got hit in the head intentionally and was thrown in there, they don't know. But the next day, um, that cross was outside the, the dirt tank. He doesn't know where it came from, it was just set up in the middle of the pasture up against the fence. Um, the other, th the next pictures are pretty graphic for you ladies. These are rape trees. So what happens is when a young woman is coming across, most of the time, regardless of how much she's paid the coyotes to bring her, it's, it's, there's a 99% chance that she will be raped. And the cartels hang their undergarments on trees to mark territories. It's kind of used as a bragging right. And it's also basically a threat to the other women that are coming across of what could happen to them. So it's very horrific and very tragic. And we, thank God, don't have any rape trees on us. We've never found one. Um, we have friends that neighbor us that have. These are really popular or common, I should say, in South Texas and like the McAllen area. Um, I, I just can't, I can't even imagine another rape tree that were pictures were taken of. So I really rushed through this and I apologize for that, but I just wanna make sure that you understand, yes, we deal with the destruction, we deal with the trash, we deal with the damage to property and stolen property and the dangers of uh, all the traffic coming across us. But what you don't understand is that they're not staying where we're at and the drugs aren't staying either. There's checkpoints and I don't have a 